Okay, welcome everyone. This is our second CATI 3D Experience User Group, August 11th. Um, we're joined by Randy Simmons, Bob McGoy, and uh, me, Todd Myers. Um, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves and then we're going to present to you um, a couple of different roles that uh, are available on the 3D Experience uh, platform. One is called Collaborative Designer for SolidWorks, and we're going to look at how we can uh, connect SOLIDWORKS to data in the cloud. Uh, next, we're going to also look at XShape, which is a cloud-based design software, which uh, is a subdivision modeling tool, which can replace a lot of the workflow that's done in traditional surface modeling tools. It's very speedy. You can think of it as working with digital clay. Um, and then we're going to have a Q&A session afterwards. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started here with our introductions. And Bob, you want to go ahead? Well, hi, thanks, Todd. Uh, my name is Bob McGoy. I'm one of the senior application engineers here at Computer Aid Technology on the Emerging Products team with Todd and Randy, um, along with Brian Pollock. Um, so, just like to welcome you to the to the presentation. I've been here for well, going on 20 years now. Along, also Randy. So um, we have vast knowledges on SolidWorks and you know, quite a bit of knowledge on the 3D Experience platform. Yep, and my name's Randy Simmons. I got the frozen video at the top, I think, there. Um, but yeah, like Bob said, I've been here for uh, going on 20 years as well, uh, using SOLIDWORKS for quite a while and focusing on these 3D experience products, uh, trying to educate everybody what those are about. And I'm Todd Myers, I'm an application engineer here, uh, also on the Emerging Products uh, Strategic Solutions team now. Um, I have about 14 years of experience with SOLIDWORKS, and I've been at CATI uh, for seven years. So, Today, we're going to talk about, obviously, the 3D Experience platform and how it's going to get your company connected by providing the tools to bring everybody in your product development process together. Uh, some of you that are already members of, of your own 3D Experience platforms um, have used some of these tools and seen some of these tools, we're definitely going to show you some tools that you haven't used, hopefully, as well. So it is a, the 3D Experience platform is a web-based system of apps that allows users to collaborate, manage, and design anywhere at any time on any device. Uh, it was built from the ground up with design in mind, but it definitely allows you guys to take advantage of different apps in their, in your everyday workflows. So along with that, it's, a design community. It allows you to connect with other users of the platform to design projects, share ideas, and always keep up to date. It's there to help eliminate some of those disconnections that you have with some of the apps you're using today. Um, it allows you to use the source that you've got today, but it also augments with tools that you can use directly inside of a web browser. And you also have access within that web browser to powerful simulation tools that you can leverage cloud computing uh, to validate your designs rather than working locally. Uh, and there is a tight integration that we're going to demonstrate with desktop SOLIDWORKS that allows you to bring work done in the cloud back to your desktop and then vice versa. You can push uh, back and forth uh, from SOLIDWORKS to the cloud and cloud back to SOLIDWORKS, which of course means that you can still take advantage of all the tools that you currently use with SOLIDWORKS today, such as locally in installed simulation tools, your CAM tools, inspection, and more. Really, the key things that the 3D Experience platform is going to offer you is one central, secure, connected location for all your apps, one subscription, no IT, no server required uh, locally, no VPN to get into your data or your apps, and a very high level of communication all within the cloud. So just like the great many of us who have been behind the wheel of a car, um, you look down, you see a dashboard. And when it comes to using the 3D experience platform, we have that same site type of mental set where you can have the things that you need on screen at any given time. The best part about this is you can go in and manipulate that dashboard to only show the things you need at any given time. So let's take a look at how this works within SOLIDWORKS. Um, and how we do that is we would install the connector software. Yeah, as, as a customer of ours, we would have a 
uh, an onboarding where we're going to help you get connected and we'll help you get this turned on. It's in your add ins. And what this does is it activates uh, SOLIDWORKS as, as a window within the task pane, very similar to how SOLIDWORKS PDM works. Um, and this add in enables the 3D experience interface um, to access data in the cloud and be able to search and, and activate that data and import it as needed. Now here, this uh, assembly is new and the information in the task pane is telling us that the files are local. They have not been saved into the cloud. You can search for files and open them here through the 3D experience task pane, or you can open them in the browser. So I'm gonna switch over to the browser and here we're going to let, see how we can navigate to data that's already saved into the cloud. And this is giving you the flexibility to work however you want. Here you can uh, drag and drop files directly from the browser into uh, an instance of SOLIDWORKS, which is running on your local machine. Uh, the component is then downloaded in the background to your local working directory, and you can quickly integrate those models into your assemblies without having to deal with latency from perhaps a local network. And the 3D experience you'll see is, is keeping track of the status of the files that are both in the cloud and on my desktop. Here in the task pane, it's showing that the file that I am uh, have just ins inserted into the assembly from the cloud um, is the current version. So the instance that's in my local directory matches the instance that's in the cloud. Yep, and browsing from the web page is just, of course, one way to get to your data. The real powerful way to find data here is to do a search. Here we're just searching for a generic PRD product. Um, and then we can use these tags to filter down uh, to a specific location, a specific person that made these files, all kinds of different ways to filter your data to get down to the files that we want. So here we're going to a particular project or a particular space down to these 21 files versus 600 files that we had at first. Through a right click, uh, I can get to a preview of this and check it, check out the part before I open it up. Uh, I can zoom pan rotate. Uh, this is using a 3D player tool to do that. We can also uh, right click on there and get access to relations, which is the parent child relationships in the file um, and seeing where this part is used and if other parts are used in this, if it were an assembly. We're gonna go ahead and back to our results and drag that collar from our search results right into our SOLIDWORKS window. And just like when Todd pulled that file down from the platform, it's gonna download a copy of that to my local cache and then insert that file in. Once that file is in here, it behaves just like any other SOLIDWORKS model, and we'll go ahead and mate that file into place just like we mated the other with that cylinder. Next, we're gonna search for yolk here and find that file. So a specific file name obviously is something you can search on, part numbers and so on. We'll drag and drop that one in, and just like before, uh, that is downloading a copy in the background of my local cache. The point there is I'm working locally on these files. The only time there's internet traffic is while I'm pulling the file down or pushing a file up. We'll make these two uh, cone faces here together, concentric, and now that part is inserted. Uh, if we take a look in the tree, we can see that those three files are up to date, and the first two files that we put in that and those have not been saved to the cloud, as Todd mentioned in that status column. So we'll go ahead and save this up to the cloud now, just by right-clicking at the top level. Those files that aren't up on the platform are being copied up. And now everything in the status column shows that it is equal or up to date with the versions on the platform. If we drag the task pane a little larger, there are many other columns that you can see out here and you can even add others uh, beyond these, but uh, we can see revision and maturity state where this is in a workflow. A file name, you can see who might be ha might have that file checked out if someone is currently working on that. Uh, part numbers and, and other things can be added in here in these columns as well. This would be useful if you had a second monitor, you could put this over on another monitor, of course. We'll drag that back down uh, to get to a back to our smaller window. And then uh, we can get to our lifecycle task pane next, just by right-clicking on a file and going to maturity. 
and see where this is in a particular workflow state. And then we're going to release this uh, when we're ready. As long as I have permissions to do that, I can just click on the release part of this and release this document. Other people then may get permissions to be able to see this or view this or, or get to this file based on things in the workflow and permissions in the workflow. So another thing that's really nice there, there Randy, uh, you, you may, when you do that save to the platform, one of my favorite things there is the ability to save other outputs along with that. So sure. um, yeah. inside of SOLIDWORKS, you can say, I want to create a step file and PDFs of things as they go up to the platform. So you easily can have somebody else download deliverables upstream, which is really nice. Absolutely. So, so right here, we're, we're back to um, where I've been living quite a bit with within a dashboard. So on, on the left hand side, you've got a, you got two different widgets, just like Randy was showing the relationships widget. Um, above that is a 3D space widget is basically the repository for your data on the right hand side is a thing called 3D play. So if if I want to go grab some things like a PDF or a JPEG or a SOLIDWORKS drawing for that matter, I can just go and drag and drop those onto that from either a search, from 3D Play, any active widget, I can drag and drop those on and work with them. So, and this gives you even more functionality, which we'll hear, see here in a second. You can see there's some JPEGs. You got a, um, a PDF of a, of a drawing there that I was doing some GDNT work on, and a lot of different formats that that player can view. Oh yeah, and one of my favorites is actually using it to look at composer data. So you can actually skip, you can step through uh, design processes from a composer file on directly on the platform. Here, here's an assembly. So if you just click the button there, we can maximize that full screen. Remember, I can see what I want to at any given time. Pan, rotate, zoom, explode, measure, markup. In that situation, that explode view wasn't there. It's just looking at the hierarchy of the parts and exploding them out into a logical order, which is pretty nice. So I really enjoy doing that. But Randy was looking at the yoke earlier. I'm going to go back and look at the yoke because I got some questions on that. So I do it find with the search. Yep. Always easy to find with a the search there. Just drag and drop that right on the 3D play. And I can start making a comment about this because as I'm looking at this file, I realize I've got some personal questions I need to ask about this. So get it in the orientation I want. I can cut a section view on it. I can measure it. Maybe I want to know what the tip to tip size of this is because I just asked for a yoke. Did I get the right one? Well, that looks like a relatively correct size there. So I'll go ahead and cut a section view on that. And I noticed that there's no visual aid showing me that's tapped or not. So I might ask Randy if that's tapped. You can also see here just by easily clicking on the little widget there, I can change what direction I'm actually pulling my section off of, which is nice. So you see over here on the right hand side, I can come in, grab my pencil. If you've got a a mouse, it actually tries to automatically make stuff better. I'm not very good at drawing with my my mouse, so I can come in and just grab a, a text based tool and just type it out. If you've got something with a digitizer built into the screen, it makes life a lot easier with that tool. Yeah, so so awesome yeah. with a touch screen. Yeah, you, you're you're fortunate, Randy. You got one of those Lenovo's that is a ThinkPad, right? You can you can just yep. draw whatever you want. So. But anyways, if if I had the Lenovo, my handwriting isn't that good anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is what it is. So, so the nice thing is now that I've got all that written up, I can share that with you, Randy, and Todd, and the rest of the people in my community. This goes back to eliminating forms of disconnect because I'm putting information about the yoke in there. If someone goes back to that search in the web and types in yoke, not only are they getting information about the 3D models, they're getting information directly about the communities that were talking about the yoke. So you've got one place to search for everything, which is nice. And then you can use your tags and your filters to find that stuff. So going forward here, I want to do a few things with that yoke. Um, 
but I'm asking Randy and Todd to give me some information about that. So we'll go ahead and get out of that as well. And over here, I'm going to grab, say, like the component I was, I did the explode view of. I can drag and drop that right into the workflow and see where that's at in the process. Is it release? Is it in work? Is it frozen? But once I've got it there, I have the option to create branches, revisions. I can duplicate it. Um, I can see if I look at the relationships, I can see what other assemblies I'm going to impact from there. So basically a where used functionality, but right inside your web browser. So I can see the, the children on the right hand side and I can see the parents on the left hand side. This one even has a non CAD file. As a it joke. does. You're, you're right. Good catch there, Andy. So that's that's a PDF we had actually showing up in the search area there. So just like anything else, I can associate that just like it was a component of a sub assembly. That's great. And so since we're here working in the cloud, there's some other tools that can help us collaborate and get other team members on track by assigning tasks. You can create and assign tasks for yourself or for others. And the platform is going to be what keeps the team members notified. They're going to be notified of the status of tasks as they progress from in work to completion. And here I've got a task that's assigned to me and I'm going to just demonstrate acting on it. So um, I simply drag the task from to do to in work. And this is going to notify the assigner that I've started uh, the, to perform that task. One of the benefits to managing these tasks is that we can attach models and documents, images, other information, whatever data we need to, to that task so that the assignee doesn't have to spend any time looking for that da data or searching the web for that. When the task is complete, uh, the assignee can attach whatever deliverables that needed to come out of that task for review. So since this all looks good, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and move this task to the complete status. So, Todd, I had a question that popped over sure. uh, during this. It's actually a pretty good good time to ask the question because it looks like you got apps and stuff up. That's right. Um, going so, into my task pane to pull up that collaborative task. So, so somebody asked the question, this ability to assign tasks, what, what role do I have to buy to get that capability? You don't actually need any additional tasks for that. That comes included with your foundational uh, roles to actually integrate into the, the platform with SolidWorks. Awesome. So it comes with that collaborative industry innovator then? That's correct. Yep. So everyone that gets the collaborative designer for SolidWorks would also have the ability to create tasks for themselves and other people on the team. And just awesome. like uh, working in the browser, as I was showing you, I just wanted to come back into SolidWorks and show you that any of the the tools that I use in the browser can be accessed from the same task pane in SolidWorks. And you can simply- a, a lot of times a, a SolidWorks user would like to stay right here in this interface. Right. So you save time just by doing all that work within this single interface. Um, and you would find files by clicking here on the compass uh, and to open up search widget for other apps. And, uh, and I'll just simply edit now that recently completed task to add a comment and let that assigner know that the task is complete. Awesome. So in this first section here, we wanted to show you guys how the interaction with the platform works inside of SolidWorks. We also showed a little bit of the platform in the web browser, which we had focused on in the, in the last uh, user group meeting in detail. So, but here we wanted to show you inside of SolidWorks. So just as a recap here, what the, the main things that the 3D Experience platform is trying to offer is one central, secure, connected location for all your apps, one subscription, no IT, no server required, no VPN in to get into your data or your apps, and that high level of communication in the cloud with those user groups and things that we showed. Um, so that's our first section. Um, we're going to do a little housekeeping here and make sure everybody knows how to get onto the user group and join our user group, and then we'll jump into the second half. Yeah, and as you start to have questions, feel free to put those into the Q&A section uh, or the chat so that we can keep track of that, and we'll address all these questions at the end of the presentation. 
Uh, but first, um, connecting to the CATI 3D Experience user group, you can uh, use your phone and hold it up here and, and uh, capture that QR code. It should take you to the CATI events page for this user group. And I'm going to break out of here and show you what that looks like. Here is the, uh, the web page. This is live. Um, you're going to get some information on what we're all about and what we're trying to do with the user group. Um, we're going to see a calendar of events. Here we're talking about um, staying connected with SOLIDWORKS on the 3D Experience platform. Next, we're going to show subdivision modeling with XShape. And you can scroll through here and check out the uh, future events that we have scheduled. Um, you can also come down here if you're interested in joining our 3D Experience user group. Uh, you can fill out your name and then simply insert the email if you're a current 3D Experience customer. If you currently have your own tenant uh, that you're using, uh, you can request for us to add you to our community. And then you can come interact with our specialists, ask questions, do the same sort of posts that Bob showed by capturing images and sharing them with the community. You can ask questions, post comments, and things of that nature. But as Todd said, that does require you to have a license of some 3D experience product to join that community. Uh, we've gotten some requests from since the last meeting, uh, of course, from people that don't, uh, but you do have to have a license of some 3D experience product to join that. That's right. But if you uh, have any questions, you can still email us. Uh, I'm going to show you an email address where you can also contact us directly. So I'm going to pop back into here. All right, we got another QR code for you, and this should open up your uh, your email app. And if you just email us at 3dxwelcome at cati.com, you should be able to directly email us. That will go to all of our uh, tech specialists on the 3D Experience user group, and one of us will uh, will reply to you with some information to get you started. Okay, so with that being said, we're, we're going to take a look at X shape. X shape is uh, a, a, an X app on the 3D experience platform. This is an app that runs strictly on the cloud. Uh, what's great about it is that it allows you to create more stylish sculptural organic forms, uh, ergonomic forms, and you're using subdivision modeling. And you can think of this as working with a digital clay. Uh, you use like push and pull uh, operations, and it's very fluid, very intuitive, uh, and it can replace a lot of the traditional uh, surface modeling capabilities and workflows of, of you know, traditional SOLIDWORKS tools um, and X design tools. So these features, what I'm showing you here is the end result uh, of what I'm going to show you here. We've got an orbital sander that I'm going to build in, in X shape. Um, the features that we're going to show are focused on quickly creating and refining forms. Uh, and, and we're going to start by what we would call creating a, um, uh, a primitive piece of geometry. And you want to do this by choosing something that represents the form you're trying to create. You modify the primitive by adding and removing divisions. And you can also change the scale and proportions of that as you create that initial primitive. Um, with that initial primitive created, then we can look at modifying it. And once that is roughed in, you can refine that design in a variety of methods. So here you can see when I select faces, vertices, uh, or edges, uh, this robot wakes up. And you can use that and you can grab the different uh, rotational uh, or arrows to drag and drop and twist that part around. All the while, X shape is preserving that curvature continuous geometry across the entire form. You can subdivide the model further to give that form more granularity, uh, create finer details and transitions. So here, several loops are added. I need to have a lot of different transitions occurring for a handle that gets us from the top of the handle to the base. We're going to be pushing and pulling some of this uh, form in and out. Uh, and we want to have a lot of uh, uh, refinement and granularity to isolate areas that I'm going to be further uh, adding some contours to. So the flexibility to insert CAD models as a reference geometry allows us 
to inspect the design that we're creating and make sure that we're not creating interferences between it and the components that need to fit within it or that it needs to connect to. You also have the ability to insert sketch geometry and scale it so that it fits what you're actually trying to do. So here I'm just taking my concept sketch for what this orbital sander should look like, and I'm inserting it on top of uh, the model geometry that I've inserted into this. This is going to help me contour and shape the styling of this design. And so we can also add transparency to our model so we can see through it. We can see the underlying components and the sketches behind it. This is going to allow us to really get a good view of how we're shaping this and how it measures up to the form that we conceptualized in perhaps a 2D sketch like I have here. You know, you can also insert photographs. So if you have existing components that this needs to fit to, uh, you can just take a picture of what you have in the shop or your studio and insert it as well. So when you're ready, you can just make your, uh, your model opaque and hide the other models and sketches that you're using to, uh, to really define the style of this. You also get some selection filters. So this allows you to grab faces or edges. Here I'm gra grabbing an edge loop and I'm going to drag that out because we need to flare that out a little bit. Um, it allows you to, uh, you know, prevent misclicks, uh, grabbing the wrong geometry. And when we want to add some sharpness to the form, we can use the crease tool to create a sharp edge. But you're not restricted to only creating uh, like 90 degree angles. You can have softer um, edges that look like they're filleted. They're not actually filleted, but you can create that using what's called this crease tool. Uh, but great for creating sharp edges and transitions throughout the model. And then as you know, you might experience some, some departures from your original intent with your design, because this is an iterative process. Um, when you make incremental changes, the scale of that might change, but you can use this bounding box to then dial in specific values for what you want your height, width, and depth to be for that sub D model. Now, vertices can also be aligned to edges or sketch lines. Uh, here, I'm just grabbing some geometry and I'm going to simply with my mouse, or if you have a sketch and touch tool uh, for your PC, you can just drag a line there and it will, will conform those selected vertices uh, to that line you sketch or to other geometry that you may have inserted into this environment. And it's just gonna quickly- Any curve, any curve yeah. you draw there, it'll follow. Follow right. along with you as you draw it. Yep. And you can do that to lines too. You can create lines as well uh, and, and sharpen up edges. Um, arc bends and flex tools are really handy. If here I want to create more of a curved handle for this. So I just drag this controller and then I can bend and pivot uh, the contours of both like the, uh, the geometry itself uh, to itself or I can change how the, this is uh, reacting to my input with the robot there and actually bend the entire form. Uh, it's just changing the location and orientation of that feature control. That's going to give you the, the flexibility to modify that design in different ways. So similar to configurations or uh, I guess multi-body design techniques, we have the ability to create what's called an ordered geometrical set. You can create different streams of history-based features. So this is different than a configuration because they can be independent of anything that's occurred before it. Um, they can be used in a variety of ways. You can explore different options for a design feature like handles, like I'm exploring here. Um, and when you really hone in on that design, um, you can delete them or you can go forward with them or simply hide them as needed. Maybe you want to come back and explore something later. Here, I'm just showing hiding and showing different uh, geometrical sets. You also have tools like symmetry, which is going to help you maintain your design intent. If you're trying to create a detail on one side, and you want it to automatically uh, uh, generate on the opposite side, you can select axes to turn on the uh, symmetry tool. So, you know, I can do twice the work in half the time and make sure that they're identical on either side. Uh, you can even subdivide smaller regions or groups of regions to allow you to create even more discrete details like I'm doing here with this handle uh, area of the design. 
You also have some different alternate modes for modifying and influencing the form. So, for example, I turned on the cage manipulator here. It gives you a different view of how those, uh, like the gestures, uh, the vectors of what's controlling your contours. So it can help you simplify some forms if you start to see something that, you know, maybe doesn't look as smooth as you like. You can take a look at it from a different view, uh, a different orientation um, and different inputs to allow you to sweeten up that design. And finally, when you want to create other discrete forms, like I'm going to add here for like a dust vent, you can simply add more primitive shapes and refine them, manipulate them, put them on different angles, crease the edges, whatever. And then these two can be merged with like Boolean combine operations to the original form. So you end up with a simple, clean form that you can uh, use in other uh, design apps to finalize. And so here we're just going to take a look of what I did going into X design to add some additional features, splitting the, the uh, form apart into different components and adding some other uh, geometry uh, that's more prismatic in design. So the flexibility of using this in the cloud is that you have other X apps like X design where you can do more of these prismatic features. You can do uh, splitting of faces and things like that, which you can also do in SolidWorks. So all of the things hey, what, that that's I just what I, created, what if I'm yeah. a what if I'm a SolidWorks user? You know, exactly I've, right. I've done that. In X shape, I've done that on the cloud. That's great, but now yep. I want to pull that down into SolidWorks. I want to split this up. I want to make molds, cores, and cavities off that. Yep, exactly. So you can do that too. And that's, if you recall, in the first segment here, um, Randy was pulling data directly down from the cloud and inserting it into SolidWorks. You can do the same thing here, uh, in with X shape models. And so here, let's take a look at that. So here, I've got the original primitive. This is before all the X design uh, modifications were made. I'm back in SOLIDWORKS and I simply search orbital sander. I'm going to grab this and drag and drop it into SOLIDWORKS. Uh, it's downloading That's how easy in the background. To get that file in. Yep. Just like we did those other ones. Super easy. It comes in as an imported body and it utilizes the 3D interconnect functionality that's built into SOLIDWORKS. Um, because of that, when any changes are made to the original model, that's going to update here. Uh, in SOLIDWORKS. So you're going to see an update to that geometry. And here we can apply things like shelling. Um, we can then add a split to separate the part into two halves for molding. Then, you know, core and cavities can be created uh, or technical documentation can be generated in, you know, technical drawings, uh, uh, SOLIDWORKS drawings for this design. And all of that can happen. Uh, ooh, I just kind of went ahead there. All that can happen in SOLIDWORKS where you can push and pull that directly into uh, SOLIDWORKS and then back up into uh, X-Shape. Yeah. Yep. Super clean, solid model comes across and you can do all the things you want to do inside of SOLIDWORKS if you have access to that tool. If not, like, like Todd mentioned, we have other cloud tools, X-Design and other things that you could continue on the modeling in on the cloud if you needed to. Yep, very intuitive, easy to use. Replaces a lot of the more time consuming workflows that rely on those traditional surface modeling techniques. Uh, really, really a great benefit to those who, who work with more ergonomic designs. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at the questions that have come in. And uh, let's see, what do we have, Bob? There's a, there's a question on the that update that we talked about inside of SOLIDWORKS. Um, and I mean, the way to answer this, I guess, is that it, it's using the 3D interconnect functionality, as Todd mentioned. Um, if you're not familiar with that, uh, definitely take a look in the help file of how that works. But it's a different way of importing a model in. Um, instead of just getting imported solid or dumb solid in the tree, it's actually maintaining a link to that file. Um, in your local cache, and then if that file is changed in X shape on the cloud and resaved on the cloud, um, you would get a notification in the task pane letting you know that your file is out of date with the one on the platform. You could then simply update your local cache one by getting latest copy, and then the 3D interconnect would update that base model inside of SOLIDWORKS and your downstream shells, your downstream splits and everything would update. So it's it's not something that, X shape is doing it's something that was already in SOLIDWORKS and is, has the ability to do through the 3D interconnect functionality. Um, so nothing nothing different than 
it would do with a Pro E file or a, a CATIA file or anything else. Um, it's just tighter integrated and using that very nice because we have the ability to get the latest version uh, through the 3D experience uh, tools. All right, so let's uh, wrap it up then and we'll look forward to hearing from you uh, and welcome you to join us again on September 8th for the next installment where we're gonna look at more product management tools and we're gonna look at some CAD tools. Thanks everybody.